On Friday, September 27th, the Middle East experienced a seismic shock when Israel carried out an airstrike on Beirut's southern suburbs that killed the iconic leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah. For the Israeli government, the killing of Nasrallah was a major coup, the biggest scalp yet in a series of assassinations that has all but decimated the top echelons of Hezbollah and the removal of one of Israel's most persistent and committed antagonists. For the Lebanese group, it was a devastating blow. Nasrallah was the group's spiritual and political guide, the face behind the group's mantra of resistance. But he was also something else, a larger-than-life figure whose reputation extended far beyond Hezbollah or Lebanon. The death of Hassan Nasrallah closes a particular chapter in the history of the Lebanese, Palestinian and Israeli conflicts. Prior to his death, Nasrallah had been many things to different people. Inside Israel, he sparked both fear and a cautious respect. In the Arab world, Hezbollah under Nasrallah for many years captured the popular imagination with its guerrilla tactics that challenged and outfought the Israeli army, driving the Israelis out of southern Lebanon in 2000 and fighting them to an unexpected stalemate in 2006. Nevertheless, the group's foray into the Syrian civil war on the side of Bashar al-Assad forever undermined its claim to be a defender of the underdog. Furthermore, that decision to move into Syria fundamentally altered the makeup of the group in a way that, as we will hear in the podcast, would prove fatal for many of its members and leaders. Joining me on the podcast this week to discuss the Arab world, Israel, and the wider region before and after the death of Hassan Nasrallah are Karim Shaheen, New Lines' Middle East editor, and Yair Wallach, a social and cultural historian of modern Palestine and Israel at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. I started by asking Yair whether he had been surprised by Israel's rapid escalation of hostilities against Hezbollah, marked most notably by the assassination of Nasrallah. I was surprised mm. because the thing is that uh, the military or elements within the military have been pushing for that for almost a year. Almost from the, I think from the 8th of October, they've been pushing to deal with Hezbollah first, even before they before any operation in uh, Gaza. Um, hmm. and but what was the reasoning for that? Um, because they estimated that Hezbollah is a more strategic adversary. And I hmm. think we can say in retrospect, I think they thought that they could deal a, a, a serious blow to Hezbollah and they were confident that they have the abilities to do that at the time that m most analysts didn't think that, that Israel has has such a clear advantage. So I think the military was confident and was willing to take the gamble of hitting Hezbollah, which is, and they thought Hamas is not going anywhere and right, they, can, right. uh, they can wait and maybe prioritize hostage release and so forth. That was something that, and that was in the beginning, if, and then approaching January, the military thought, let's announce that we won in Gaza and move to the north as quickly as possible. And again, many analysts said this doesn't make any sense because the the consequences of such a war would be disastrous to Israel, even if it deals really heavy blows to Hezbollah. And I think that the military were probably confident that they actually can neutralize Hezbollah effectively. Netanyahu at the same time is, I mean, by his character, he's very risk averse. It mm. always takes him a lot, a lot of time to to go into these escalations. He is not one to launch a surprise attack, and even now we saw that, you know, the pages attack. It took a few days, and then there was another bombing, and then there was another. Bombing. So it wasn't all at once, as, as some expected. So. Netanyahu has this thing of, you know, being dragged to do something and then biding his time to see, to, to weigh his options. And I would say I do not rule out that this was accidental. So... That it was accidental? Yes. That hmm. the... Um, I mean, it was published in various media sources that the pages attack was you know, use it or lose it opportunity because Israel thought yeah. it was going And it may have cascaded from there. The Pedro's attack created turmoil within Hezbollah, created further opportunities, and each time the military was able to push Netanyahu to escalate further and further. So I, 
you know, maybe mm. two weeks ago they had a very clear plan of what they're going to do, but I would not be surprised at all if actually it was a kind of um, a snowball effect. Because mm. this, yeah, yeah, because this was the the reporting that that Hezbollah had realized there was something with the pages, and so they said, okay, let's just let's use it now, get what we can from it. Yeah. And- even with the the latest attack on on Nasrallah himself. You know, what we know is that Netanyahu wanted to postpone it until this week. He did not want to make a decision before he left to the UN. And basically, he was pushed by uh, the defense minister and the military. You know, we probably was told, you have to decide now. And by then, he couldn't say no. Uh, but it was not his plan. Uh, and That's interesting. Yeah. Because, the you know, the killing of the other Hezbollah leaders is not as much of a dramatic escalation as the killing of Nasrallah, which is something we'll come to talk about because Nasrallah was sort of a figurehead. So you, you think that it's possible that Netanyahu and the political leadership were pushed into the killing of some of the top commanders. But surely it's a hell of a political calculation to then go further and take Nasrallah out. Yes, I mean, uh, absolutely. I think it's, uh, again, this is something I think that some people were pushing to and some people were probably objecting to. Nasrallah was seen as a kind of uh, known factor, as someone who was very mm, predictable. Right. So uh, there were people in the uh, Israeli security establishment saying it's better to have him there than someone we don't know uh, very well and we can't. We can't know how they would act. Yeah. But I think mm. the advantage here was to um, decapitate the entire leadership of Hezbollah. And in that kind of context, this kind of assassination could be much more, um, you know, uh, has have a much more profound effect rather than if they just assassinated Nasrallah, but all the kind of people around him would still be around there would be a kind of easy succession and Hezbollah, you know, it would still be a serious blow, but we can see Hezbollah recovering and probably able to launch counterattacks. But that's not the case. By taking out the entire leadership, I think the opportunity was such that the military was certainly not going to miss on it. And mm. and, and in so far, it looks like they've been able to neutralize the strategic abilities of Hezbollah. And that's, you know, that's something that most analysts in Israel did not think that the IDF has that capability. They expected a war to be disastrous to Israel, including hundreds, if not thousands of casualties, including hits on the energy infrastructure and and electricity and so forth. So, so in that sense, it surprised even people within Israel that kind of mm. that level of success. From a strategic point of view, let's let's look on the other side of it. Why do you think? Because I'm sure you've seen the the graphics that the Israelis put out about the various leadership in, in Hezbollah, and they were decapitating this one, and then this one, and this one, and you just had Nasrallah at the top on his own. And I thought to myself, you know, why if Hezbollah can respond, why would they not respond early once two of the three top leadership have gone? Why not immediately launch an attack? Because then you are, you're trying to reestablish the deterrence. Yes, I mean, they were, they were caught within this dynamic of assured mutual destruction, that the assumption is that no party will escalate be, beyond a certain limit, because that would take this to another level, which would mean destruction of Lebanon and destruction of a significant part of urban infrastructure in Israel. So I think their assumption, first of all, that Israel won't do it, but once it was clear that Israel was willing to take the risks, uh, for them to escalate would still mean destruction of Lebanon, which is something that Mm. they had to weigh uh, quite carefully, especially that Hezbollah is far less popular in Lebanon than it used to be. And because uh, this war particularly was uh, unpopular, the fact that they dis- they've been joined Hamas and to support Hamas since October was not very popular. A lot of people said it was unnecessary and put- posing too much risk. So for, Hezbo- right. for Hezbollah to be seen as the one kind of taking this to an all-out war, 
I think they were very cautious. In some way, maybe Nasrallah proved the rational actor or the more risk-averse uh, actor in this conflict. But also, I think they failed to take on board uh, the fact that the uh, their communication system was compromised on on such a level. I think this was mm. increasingly clear, and certainly after the Pages attack, and to continue business as usual or to continue on the same pace as before, just opened the risk of um, these kinds of attacks from Israel. And I think that's kind yeah. of a, they, you know, they. They saw repeatedly that Israel has the kind of intelligence that Israel never had on Hezbollah, you know, in, in 2006. In 2006, they weren't able to hit any major leadership or even mid-leadership uh, uh, commanders. So this was something different. And instead of st- taking stock and saying, either we escalate completely or we stop, they just continued pacing gradually and giving Israel excuses to um, to hit the leadership more and more. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, also, sometimes with kind of the strategy and the military intelligence and the war, you, you don't know what's behind it. It may well be that the Israelis have some piece of technology or some mole within Hezbollah, and they think, okay, now, if we don't get as many of the leadership now as we can with this asset, we may yeah. lose them for another 10 years. So let's just take the, the chance. Yeah, but I, I have to say... Uh, I mean, when they reported that there was intelligence on a meeting of Nasrallah on the 8th of October last mm. year, I thought, you know, this is something that was probably very unusual. But if Israel supplied the pages to Hezbollah and was listening to them all the time, then we can assume that they know this organization through and through. So I think they, and we see this, the fact that they were able to launch so many attacks on the high command and the leadership of Hezbollah indicates yeah. that they had unparalleled level of intelligence, which it means that it wasn't a one-off. That was something that I think Nasrallah probably refused to accept. And in some ways, maybe it's a hubris of, you know, they built a kind of very capable army. They had all these capabilities. They had uh, something that looked like mutual deterrence with Israel. And when that collapsed, they were not quick to take that. You can't board. respond I mean, to it, yeah. And yeah, we've seen, yeah. in, in some ways, it's similar to the hubris that led to, to, led to the Israeli collapse on October the 7th with Hamas. Mm. They kind of assumed yeah. it w- wasn't going to happen. And when it right, happened, it right. took them a very long time to, to uh, uh, regroup. Mm. No, that's a very good analogy. Uh, I mean, the part of the podcast is really to talk about what Nasrallah meant to various parts of the region and the outside world. I, I wanted to, to ask you about what he represented in the minds of Israelis. So he was the most formidable enemy for Israelis, um, for Jewish Israelis. I, 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 it's more formidable that, than anyone else certainly any Arab militant or leader in the region and uh, probably more than uh, Iranians as well. Israelis had a certain awe of him, a certain Mm. respect because he proved himself to be someone who, when he threatens, he usually delivers. I mean, I remember during the 2006 when they uh, launched a, rock, a, a missile attack on a vessel of the Israeli Navy. And, he, and exactly at the same time, Nasrallah was giving a speech saying that they did that. And for Israelis, it was just unthinkable that kind of that, that someone, especially someone heading an armed militia, could challenge them in that, such a way. And in a way, and, and there's a lot of condescending and racist approach to various kind of Arab adversaries, whether it's Sinwar or others, you know, certainly before the 7th of October, that the Israelis tend to look down upon them as kind of inferior. And with Nasrallah, it wasn't like that at all. I mean, he was seen as, as a real formidable threat and also someone that knew how to push the buttons of Israeli society. And his 
speech from 2000 when uh, Israel withdrew in a quite haphazard and, and, and rapid way from Occupy South Le- Lebanon, you know, not according exactly to plan. And he gave the speech saying that Israel is weaker than the um, spider web. That, yes, yeah. we are t- talking about a nuclear power, but actually we exposed how weak they are, weaker than spider web, and we can cut through this if we are organized enough, if we are you know, cautious enough, if we are prepared enough. And this idea that Israel is actually very vulnerable, I think, drove a lot of Israelis insane because it exactly spoke to their f- deep anxieties and vulnerabilities that they are maybe weak. They are maybe with all the kind of military capabilities that they have, maybe they are have this kind of weakness and they can be overrun. And that's partly about this kind of uh, post-traumatic, post-genocide Jewish anxieties and partly because Israel sees itself as a kind of uh, fortress within a hostile region that always wants to get rid of it. And th- so that kind of anxiety is there and the fact that Nasrallah said, you know, after Israel withdraws, saying, you know, you are weak as spider web, that really was such a an insult, and 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 uh, that in many ways drove the 2006 war. I think Olney wanted to prove that Israel is, is strong, and he kind of failed in some ways. And I'm sure that that sentence played in the heads of all Israeli commanders and all Israeli leadership that need to prove that and and also to eliminate Nasrallah as someone mm. that was able to challenge Israel and establish deterrence vis-a-vis Israel, which again, no other, you know, Hamas in some ways came close, but not really. And with, with uh, Nasrallah, it was, it really felt that way. And people talk about, you know, mutual, assured mutual destruction. And certainly, you know, given the situation, the rest of the region, Syria is kind of still reeling from the the civil war. Iraq is in the same position and other countries are allies of Israel, more or less. So Israel doesn't face any kind of serious military threat from any of its uh, neighbors. And and Nasrallah was that kind of uh, represented that kind of threat that was not easy to get rid of. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that psychological element is a, a big part of, I think, what we want to explore in the podcast. Because as you say, the, you know, this one speech 24, 25 years ago now still drives so many people within the military intelligence um, establishment. And I, I, I think, you know, if you think about it, as you say, it might have in some way led to the 2006 war that if that was an attempt to re-establish some sort of psychological or military deterrence, it definitely failed. And then that kind of makes it worse because you you want to go after this organization and establish deterrence, and then it just doesn't work. Yes. So in some ways, I mean, in some ways, uh, the 2006 wasn't a clear-cut loss for Israel, for I think, by any means, because... No, no, not at all. But that's what makes it worse, yeah. that it wasn't a clear-cut victory. Exactly. So, but but in the memory of the Israel pub, Israeli public, it's remembered as a, as a defeat, effectively. Even mm, though, yeah. you know, since then, for 18 years, Hezbollah refrained from any escalation in the border. So, or for 17 years, say. So until last year, you know, there was a very long stretch of quiet. There was no this kind of small incursions, which it did before. So in that mm. sense, it's, it's you know, it achieved that aim. But in Israeli memory, it's remembered as a defeat, is remembered as something that started with a lot of bravado and ended with a, a, a huge loss of life with Hezbollah shooting rockets well until the end with a sense of... Uh, humiliation on the Israeli side. And um... and then I think the, I was talking to a colleague about this, that the, what happened in northern Israel last year during the start of the Gaza war, where you have 60, 70,000 Israelis becoming internally displaced, that also then disturbs the Israelis. Because as you say, there's this profound sense of needing to feel safe 
to feel that the military is able to protect them. Yes, and it was actual, you know, these uh, towns, villages were hit very hard. I mean, some of them, a large share of the buildings literally destroyed by anti-tank missiles. So, and there was no end in sight. And that's something that kind of pushed Netanyahu to do this as well, because there's a growing pressure also within his own supporters saying, okay, why why weren't you doing anything about this? And, mm. and it became more difficult to answer that question after military operations in uh, the Gaza Strip effectively ended. I mean, you know, Israel is not, there's no clear uh, objective now, military objective in the, in the Gaza right, Strip. Right, right. They've run out of targets, y- essentially. Yes. Uh, and, and the pressure is rising about the north, but also Netanyahu, because it's, his political interest is to prolong the war as long as possible. He was looking for a, a way to prolong it. And it's not surprising that he looked north to, to Lebanon. But again, I think he was uh, unsure himself how much about how, how much he wants to escalate this. Hmm. Well, I'm asking you this before there's been any major Hezbollah response, so things might change. But do you think that this what, what do you think this new Hezbollah after Nasrallah might look like? I I think it's... I don't think anyone can know, uh, can know at this no, point. Yeah. I think it seems to me that it depends more on Lebanese dynamics than on anything that Israel does. Because whatever Israel does, it can kill the, the leadership, etc. It um, can hit some weapon bunkers and so forth. But there are still estimated 100,000 fighters, part of the military force of Hezbollah. So that's kind of, you know, a good size uh, military force that will have low level and mid level commanders that can rise to the top and they have military experience, etc. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say that that's the end of them as a military force. But the question is, how does it play within Lebanese society and and will there be any attempt to use that the current disarray to change the dynamic? Will people think differently about Iran and their relations with Iran because Iran seemed to fail Hezbollah in many ways? So this is really internal. It's hard to know. Yeah, uh, le- it's likely that there'll be a long a long tail of discussion within Lebanon, within Hezbollah, about what this all meant. Yes, I think that it's very difficult to eliminate a movement that has a wide base of support in Lebanon, that plays a yeah. social role for these people, and mm-hmm. it's well anchored within its people. And uh, and we've seen it with Hamas. I mean, Hamas as well, their leaderships were, were assassinated repeatedly, And a new generation comes to the fore and is able to reorganize if the right, if the context is right for it. Um, And and of course, Hezbollah still has its weapons and its missiles and none of that is, I mean, a lot of them have been blown up, but I mean, they still have a lot. That hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah. I think what, what they did find out that growing from a small militia to an army with uh, an arsenal that wouldn't shame even uh, uh, regional powers in terms of uh, drones and and missiles and so forth, that means that you're more exposed. And I think they didn't quite realize how exposed they became. And it's it's a much more difficult thing to operate a military, like a a conventional or semi-conventional military force than it is a clandestine guerrilla uh, organization and it's it's very clear that you know Hezbollah before and up to 2006 it was something that Israelis couldn't really deal such blows to they tried repeatedly repeatedly and every time was uh, a failure and but once it became a semi conventional military after it what it did in Syria then it was actually much easier to hit it I think that's uh, something that they will need to grapple with if they were to kind of try to to, to recuperate that role. That was Yair Wallach in London. 
That question about the impact of Hezbollah's entry into Syria was one I wanted to put to New Lines' Middle East editor, Karim Shaheen. Along with Hassan Hassan, the editor-in-chief, he co-authored a piece for the magazine entitled The Day After Hassan Nasrallah that looked at the seismic role he played in the region. But first, I asked him for his immediate reaction to the killing of the group's leader. I mean, I'm, I'm still in shock, to be entirely honest with you. And, and I think most of the people that I've spoken to in, in Lebanon are still in shock as well. We're still sorting through the impact and the fallout from the pagers attack, for God's sake, right. which, which happened, you know, less than two weeks ago, something which was something absolutely monumental in, in you know, counterinsurgency operations and in, uh, in how uh, states conduct wars and the implications of it for non-state actors. You know, we're still sorting through that, and um, uh, and then the uh, the targeting of Nasrallah happened, and uh, and there's there's just immense shock. I'm, uh, I'm, I don't think even his rivals, even the people who absolutely hated him, uh, you know, they they grew up in a world that was uh, in an Arab world that was you know, shaped by the ideology that, that he carried on his sleeve. Certainly, if you were in Lebanon, uh, he was a formative part of your political experience and shaped much of how you see Lebanon, Lebanese politics, the Arab world, Israel, and uh, and the region around you. Mm. So so uh, up until today, I think there's still, people are still kind of trying to grapple with the fallout from it. Uh, and people are, uh, are trying to analyze uh, its potential impact on Hezbollah, on Iran in the region, you know, all these strategic and tactical implications. Mm. Uh, but I don't think it changes the fact that he's, he was such a, uh, an overwhelming presence uh, in the region, and um, and he's gone now, and uh, and I think people are still trying to come to terms with what that means on a personal level, in addition to what it means in the greater political and, and military arena. Yeah, I mean, strategically, I think it's it's really intriguing, and I think that's why I mentioned this when we interviewed Yair Wallach that obviously the Israelis had put out a bunch of these these images which showed what they said was the command of Hezbollah and that they had killed this person and assassinated this person and so on and so on. And there was only a couple of people left below Nasrallah. And of course, Nasrallah was there at the top. And I think most people didn't expect that even if the Israelis went after the second in commands, that they would go after the figurehead of Nasrallah, because that seemed to violate a kind of detente that they had about where the red lines were. That's right, and I think I think that goes to uh, you know the core of the miscalculation that that Hezbollah made in thinking that they can play by the same rules that have governed their interactions and skirmishes with the Israelis for years now, almost two decades, and for these, uh, but where, also for these months. I mean, the the rules of engagement have yeah. remained roughly the same for the last year since the Gaza war started. Right. But it is clear that the Israelis had been preparing for something like this for quite some time. You know, I mean, when, when the pagers attack happened, the question was, why now? Mm. Right. What are they trying to do? What are they thinking of doing? This seems like the opening salvo of a war. Right. Uh, and for the longest time, the, the assumption was that, I mean, uh, as we said in the piece, you know, uh, Hezbollah carried out the longest war that any Arab force has carried out against Israel, right? It, it's been going on for almost a year since uh, the uh, since right after the October 7th attacks uh, by Hamas. Uh, that's when Hezbollah launched its sustained campaign of, of rocketing uh, northern Israel. Right. So, so this has been going on for quite some time, and they were banking on the fact that they can have this controlled escalation. They can save face by showing that they are, uh, uh, you know, standing up for the people of Gaza by uh, targeting Israel even if it did not necessarily have much of an impact on, on the ground. But the reality is that it seems like the Israelis have been preparing for something like this for quite some time, uh, maybe to the point of neglecting putting resources into into their front with Hamas. Um, and, and that's why this was uh, so successful, I think. But the other aspect of this is that there was no retribution for prior uh, assassinations of senior figures in the Iran uh, axis, uh, right? So, you know, you go back to 2020 and uh, when Qasem Soleimani was assassinated uh, by the Trump administration, you know, it was a step that had been seen as a step too far by successive leaders in the United States and in the West and even in Israel, uh, because they felt that it might actually spark all out war with Iran. Uh, and so Qasem Soleimani was never directly targeted, even though the Israelis were killing Iranian commanders left and right in places like Syria. But, you know, after uh, Qasem Soleimani was killed, there was no real retaliation. The, the long-awaited Iranian response never 
properly materialized. And then, you know, when Ismail Haniya, the, the leader of Hamas, was assassinated uh, recently, uh, a few months ago, uh, people predicted that it could lead to regional war. And uh, and again, nothing happened, even though he was killed um, in an apartment building in the middle of Tehran during a gathering of officials. Uh, so, uh, you know, once, once that happened, I think it becomes clear now that the gloves are off for the Israelis and they're going to go uh, after the heads of organizations that, that they want to go after. And they won't be deterred by the traditionalist argument that these escalations could end up spiraling out of control and, and leading into a broader conflict. And it remains to be seen whether this will happen in the case of Nasrallah. Obviously, the Iranians have responded. We'll see how the Israelis respond. And that's uh, and all that tit for tat is still ongoing. But whether it kind of spirals into something you know, more serious is, uh, is an open question. So let's talk about uh, Nasrallah himself. So in this piece, this essay that you and Hassan wrote, it's called End of an Era, What Hassan Nasrallah's Assassination Spells for the Middle East. And you talk about Qasem Soleimani, because I think Soleimani, as you say, was the beginning of the surprising assassinations. Nobody expected this general who was so pivotal to the Axis and to Iran to, Iran, to actually be targeted. And then he was, and then very little happened. But you wrote that, both of you wrote that comparing... Nasrallah to Soleimani, another commander, would be, quote, to overlook the visceral hold that Nasrallah has in the region, unlike the shadowy figure of Soleimani. So let's talk about the similarities and the differences between those two people. Right. So, I mean, both both figures were absolutely instrumental to Iran's efforts, right? Soleimani was the architect of Iran's external power projection all over the region. He was deeply involved in the conflicts in Syria and in Iraq, and he, uh, you know, was often on the ground. And uh, and he tried to emulate Nasrallah, I think, in terms of, um, uh, you know, appearing on the ground with soldiers, taking photos, even though he, he'd been for a very, very long time shy of, of being photographed in, in uh, operational theaters and, and on the ground uh, in all these conflicts. But he really tried to take on this mantle of a key figure that was working within the system that that Iran had established and that he helped establish uh, of power projection across the region. Uh, And Nasrallah was similarly instrumental to those efforts. I mean, Nasrallah was, you know, is the probably the most uh, uh, important person in terms of Bashar al-Assad's survival in Syria, uh, his involvement in the war in uh, 2013 when Hezbollah uh, announced that it had entered the war, probably after months of, of already being on the ground, you know, was uh, uh, was a key component of this Iranian strategy. And for them, the war in Syria was an existential issue uh, because they felt that the collapse of Bashar al-Assad's regime uh, would spell the end of, of this axis uh, of resistance mm. to Israel. And so they justified the war there as uh, one of necessity and as one that was uh, aimed at uh, fighting uh, Islamist militants and terrorists and, and all of this, even though, you know, effectively what they were doing for the most part was starving Syrian civilians and, and crushing an, an uprising that was, you know, trying to overthrow a tyrannical regime. Nasrallah also, you know, expanded Hezbollah's influence by training fighters in, in Iraq and uh, and in Yemen as well. But the, the key difference between them is that Nasrallah has this, you know, as you quoted from the piece, this kind of cultural hold over uh, the, the Middle Eastern psyche. Uh, yeah. That's something that has been going on for quite some time, given that he was one of the few to actually stand up to Israel. I still personally remember being in college and uh, crowding around the television to watch his uh, speeches during the 2006 war. He, he was an instrumental figure and, and a real cultural presence beyond even the, the political theater and the conflict because he had this charisma, he would joke around, he'd make jokes during his uh, his speeches. We had a piece about his humor and how it contributed to the self-confidence that the Shiite community in Lebanon uh, experienced whenever he, he spoke or whenever he uh, was visible in, uh, in the public sphere. Right. And so when we talk about Nasrallah and the kind of the myth of Nasrallah, you have to talk about the 2006 war. And that was the period that really elevated Nasrallah, I think, from being a figurehead within one particular community over one particular conflict into something much broader in the the public imagination of the Arab world. Correct. I mean, if you go back to surveys at the time, uh, you can see that the most popular re- leaders in the Middle East were Hassan Nasrallah, Bashar al-Assad, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, which is insane to think about today. Today, uh, yeah. But they 
they were seen as people who were standing up to Israel. Obviously, Hezbollah is an insurgency. All they had to do was hold Israel to a standstill or prevent it from achieving its goals for it to be dubbed a divine victory. But th that presence was, as you said, elevated due to being one of the few Arab leaders to, air quotes, succeed in a war against Israel. Yeah. So, I mean, I think Israelis would even put it more forcefully that they had succeeded multiple times against Israel, forcing the, the retreat from the south of Lebanon. And now, as you say, the longest war the last year, it's still ongoing. I mean, now they're actually engaging as we speak. They're now engaging with Hezbollah troops are engaging with, with Israeli troops inside Lebanon. But the 2006 divine victory speech that you mentioned, we talked about this with Yair Wallach. This is the incident that has been called the Hanit Surprise of the 2006 war when Hezbollah struck the flagship vessel of the Israeli Navy, the INS Hanit. And that was something that you talk about in the piece, and Yair mentions this, where he says that the attack had this huge psychological impact on Israel's feeling of vulnerability. And I think sometimes it's hard to understand what that means, even from the perspective of the region. But it had a huge psychological impact on the Arab side of the conflict as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're sitting there and you're watching television and, and uh, you know, I, I, can't, I wasn't in Lebanon, but I, I can't imagine what the impact of that moment uh, would have been if you were someone who could just look out the window during that speech. Uh, you know, he was uh, he was delivering a speech on the progress of the war and he tells viewers to look out their window to see an Israeli ship burning after it had just been uh, struck by a Hezbollah missile. And you can imagine the impact a moment like that can have on uh, on viewers in Lebanon, let alone the, the rest of the Middle East. I mean, uh, you're, you're looking here at, at an army that Arabs have long been told is completely invulnerable, cannot be defeated by, you know, the means that are available to armies in the, in the region, that it, it's backed by all of this technological prowess, whether of its own or, or that belongs to America and that America provided them with. And and you see this this militia leader essentially on television being able to presumably from his hiding place uh, synchronize the viewership with an attack that was ongoing in that moment against a, a key Israeli strategic asset. It's it's showmanship, you know, of the highest caliber, and it it had an immense impact. And the, the reality is that. People like Hassan Nasrallah traded in something called dignity, right? Whether you believe that to be the case or not, and whether they often succeeded or not, and whether they were brutal or not to their own populations, they claim to trade in this currency of dignity. Arabs often speak of, of Israel exhibiting something called ghatrasa, right? It's, a, it's an Arabic word that means arrogance, but carries with it connotations of, uh, you know, superiority complex and, uh, and anger and spitefulness and, and things like that. Um, and th that word, uh, you know, Nasrallah uh, symbolized the ability of Arabs to stand up to this and to prove that they are worth something and that they are capable of responding forcefully to, to Israel as well. And he was the only Arab leader who could credibly claim that he could do that, even though he was at the same time would go on to to fight in Syria alongside a murderous regime and starve Syrian civilians. Yeah, and that, that's his duality. Yeah. So we will come to the second half of that duality. But this is something I really wanted to explore in the podcast, because I think it's something that particularly in the West, I think is is not very well understood. And it was a point that, that you and Hassan made in the essay, but it's one that particularly that Hassan was interested in, which is that Nasrallah, this is a quote, fuses the roles of military commander, political leader and cultural icon. And it was that that allowed him to not merely work within the system which had existed before him, but actually create it, expand it, amplify it to the point where Hezbollah created a veneer, maybe even for a period of reality, of a balance of power with Israel, which is partly what these attacks are intended to break apart. And it's that that view of this figurehead that I think that is so underexplored. And it's really something that I wanted us to think and, and, and uh, discuss. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Nasrallah's appeal in, in terms of the Lebanese arena itself, he had well-known Lebanese pop stars singing songs that, that glorified the party's exploits against Israel. There were uh, singers who quoted from his speeches in their songs. So uh, he he had this this presence, this charisma. You know, he's the only one really in Hezbollah who could actually make these jokes and and uh, and these uh, overtures. You know, and uh, and he would do these things during his speeches when when he would take a jab at, at like a political rival or, or or at Israel or at the West, and people would laugh and they would respond to it in this way. 
the rest of Hezbollah, if you've ever spoken to any of them or listened to their speeches, have absolutely zero charisma. They they do not inspire you. They they do not joke around. They they you know they have a constant sort of poker face expression. But Nasrallah would you know raise his eyebrow or make a joke or or uh, needle this person or that, uh, and so. He wasn't just glorified, he was also memified, which is yeah. the, the sort of thing that indicates someone's, you know, cultural penetration from his jokes to his expressions, both making fun of him and kind of uh, lightly glorifying him as well through those those memes and stickers and, on WhatsApp and, and groups and things like that. So he, he really had that uh, cultural penetration that extended to the artistic sphere, to the pop culture sphere, uh, and to people's everyday interactions with one another, even as uh, he he became a more and more divisive figure. Those cultural appropriations became sharper. But the fact that he triggered them is uh, an indication, a sign of his being ever present uh, in the Lebanese public sphere. Well, now let's talk about the second half of that duality, because this popularity of Nasrallah and Hezbollah didn't last. And in the essay, you cite the Arab uprisings of 2011 as the moment at which that myth becomes tainted. So in 2013, Hezbollah entered the Syrian civil war on the side of Bashar al-Assad. And they are, as you said earlier, perhaps the group that is most responsible for Assad's continuing grip on the presidency. There was no secret prior to 2013 about this alliance between Hezbollah and the Assad regime. But why did the group's military foray into Syria prove so controversial in the popular imagination of the region? So just a small note on that, you know, when the Arab uprisings actually began, Hezbollah, you know, publicly came out in support of a lot of the opposition movements that were taking place at the time, you know, whether that was in Egypt and Tunisia and Bahrain and elsewhere across the region, uh, Hezbollah expressed its support for all these Arab uprisings. Mm. Um, it was only in 2013, but, you know, and, and initially Hezbollah did not take a position on Syria either. In fact, there were debates for the longest time about whether Hezbollah would back Assad, you know, who, who was its ally, or if they would actually actually take the side of the people. And so uh, so everyone was, it was still up in the air as a question. It was only in 2013 that Hezbollah announced formally that they were joining the war. And initially the rationale was that they needed to secure border towns that were taken over by, by Syrian rebels that they claimed to be Islamists. And that's, that's when they entered the war. And as a consequence of that, there was a, a lot of violence that was happening in Lebanon in the direct aftermath of Hezbollah announcing his decision. There were several suicide bombings that I covered at the time in various parts of the of the southern suburbs of Beirut, as well as in other parts of the of the country that were claimed by Al-Qaeda, that were claimed by ISIS and uh, and so on. And, and this became uh, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because Hezbollah said that they were going there to fight terrorists. Primarily, they were fighting Syrian rebels. And then the terrorists actually came to Lebanon in order to retaliate against Hezbollah's at- uh, actions. And, and this uh, this influenced uh, the way the party was perceived uh, more broadly because it was no longer that the party was sacrificing young uh, Lebanese uh, men uh, on the front lines with Israel. They were sacrificing them in a fight alongside a tyrannical regime that was starving its population. You know, Hezbollah was very famously took part uh, in the siege of Madaya, this, this border town near, near Lebanon, by essentially besieging the entire area and starving its civilians to death until the UN uh, you know, negotiated a deal in which these civilians were to be evacuated. So that long period of involvement, public involvement, and as you say, uh, Hezbollah fighters were coming home in body bags, and that made a big difference. And of course, the Lebanese public, the broader Arab publics, were able to see the impact of Hezbollah fighters on Syrian civilians. What did that change among Arab attitudes? It, it made people see Hezbollah as a Shia militia, as a sectarian militia primarily, because the war in Syria across the region in media outlets and public statements were perceived largely as a sectarian conflict, uh, you know, at least after, you know, Iran became more forcibly, uh, more forcefully involved uh, in the conflict and with it uh, Hezbollah. The the perception was that what was going on in Syria was a sectarian war. On one side, you had Bashar al-Assad and the Alawites and, and his Shia backers in Iran. And on the other side, you had primarily Sunni rebels uh, who were fighting against the repression by, by the Assad regime. And so Hezbollah getting involved in the conflict on the side of Assad obviously had people who believed in the cause of democracy in Syria uh, up in arms about the fact that a party that 
was supposed to be a defender of the weak and a defender of innocence, because that you know Israel was the Goliath in the uh, in their battle with Hezbollah, but instead became an oppressor itself uh, and became a party that was besieging civilians and, and starving them to death. And so Hassan Nasrallah increasingly became perceived as the leader of a gang, the leader of a Shiite militia gang, rather than the leader of a essentially a, a liberation, a national liberation movement, that which he could claim to be when he was only fighting against uh, Israel. Obviously, this uh, is something that the region as a whole, their attitudes change towards Nasrallah. But within Lebanon itself, uh, you know, the, the, the Lebanese opposition had been seeing Hezbollah's brutality in the country for years before that, uh, starting with, you know, the assassinations in 2005 uh, of Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri and, uh, and of other members of his political party and of, and of his political bloc, who were assassinated by, uh, by Hezbollah members who were indicted and then convicted of these crimes. And obviously, they, they also, whenever they felt that their position in Lebanon was threatened, they would send in their black-shirted militia members to intimidate everyone. Uh, so in Lebanon, this perception preceded the, the Arab Spring, uh, but across the region, it became a much more uh, generalized view of Hezbollah uh, after the, the involvement in Syria. And so that was not just the beginning of a change in the way that Hezbollah was thought of, but it was actually a beginning of a change in the way that Hezbollah was constituted. That at, at that point, they went from being this militia group to expanding into something more like a conventional army. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they uh, expanded, as you said, they sent troops there, they sent advisors, they were participating in in, uh, in sieges. And I think this was, you know, this was actually part of the conversation at the time about how Hezbollah was gaining valuable battlefield experience in the course of, you know, starving and murdering Syrians, that they were able to test strategies that belonged more to a conventional army. Now, obviously, the problem with that is that you become just as vulnerable as a conventional army when your entire head on death is that you're fighting an unequal war, right? That that's that's your strength actually against Israel is that you do not have to be you know hidebound by the the traditional limitations of a traditional army, mm. and that obviously exposes them to to a lot of these to penetration by the Israeli intelligence services and becoming more vulnerable in terms of their personnel in terms of their logistics and activities right. uh, to monitoring by the Israelis. Yeah, and this is a point that Yazid Sayyid of the Carnegie Middle East Center made in a piece in the FT. And this is a quote that Hezbollah went from being a highly disciplined purist to a group that let more people in than they should have. The complacency and arrogance, says Sayer, was accompanied by a shift in its membership, and they started to become flabby. That he traces to being the reason why they started to be able to be infiltrated by Israelis and their intelligence services. It stands to reason that uh, you know once you open up the door to collaboration with uh, you know a military like the Syrian military that you know is is known for being corrupt and incompetent that you would then open the door for further infiltration when normally uh, you could just rely on the integrity of your own communication systems and your own the discipline of your own fighters that you selected to join uh, Hezbollah and that you trained as opposed to a military that was incapable of of winning a civil war in its own country when it had the superior weaponry and guns for the duration of, of the Syrian civil war over the, the rebels that they were fighting. And you can see this in real time because if you look back at some of the casualties, you know, Israel uh, spent much of the war in Syria bombing Hezbollah and Iranian uh, positions and and, uh, and facilities and convoys that were supposed to be transporting weapons to Lebanon. They repeatedly bombed those facilities. They also assassinated the probably the most senior military figure at the time in Hezbollah in Syria, uh, you know, Mustafa Badruddin, who was uh, who was a key suspect in the Hariri assassination and was uh, Ahmad Mounia's brother-in-law. Ahmad Mouni, obviously the, the former military commander who led Hezbollah in the, in the war against Israel in 2006. Bedruddin was assassinated in Syria. And to this day, there are, there are still conspiracy theories uh, about how he was potentially sold out and who actually murdered him and who actually killed him. And that's just 
one example of, of them losing one of the key figures in their military apparatus as a result, as a direct result of the war in Syria. And, uh, and you know, and this is in addition to the countless convoys and commanders, both Lebanese and Iranian, who were killed in, in various Israeli strikes deep inside Syria and along the border with Lebanon, you know, in order to stem the, the flow of weaponry from, from and through Syria to Lebanon. Let's pitch it forward then and ask what you think might happen after Nasrallah's death. What kind of vacuum does it leave symbolically at the heart of the Iranian-led, quote, resistance movement? Yeah, it's extremely difficult. Obviously, Hezbollah is in a position right now where uh, they have sustained their worst defeat since their foundation. And Israel has scored its greatest military victory against Hezbollah since the party's inception. It's very difficult to contemplate where they could go from here. I think Hezbollah is in a position right now of just trying to absorb all the shocks that the party's command structure and political military echelon uh, have absorbed. What is clear to me is that Nasrallah as a figure is irreplaceable from within Hezbollah's current cadre of leaders. There was no figure that commanded the the same hold over the public sphere uh, in both Lebanon and the rest of the region. He very much built Hezbollah as an organization and its mechanisms and its command structure and its role in Lebanese society. And it was the linchpin of, of Iran's uh, power projection efforts in the region. But it's, it's important to remember two things. One, and, and this does not get spoken of enough, is that the cost to civilians has been absolutely immense. You know, it's, it's unfortunate that Nasrallah's death overshadowed the fact that Israel dropped multiple 2,000-pound bunker buster bombs on one of the most crowded parts of Beirut and essentially vaporized uh, a bunch of apartment buildings. Over a million Lebanese civilians have been displaced so far, and I, th- I believe it's over 200 thousand who fled into Syria, you know, a country that has yet to recover from from a debilitating civil war. So there's there's an immense humanitarian cost to all of this and, and to everything that's happening. The other thing is that Hezbollah was formed as a result of Israel invading Lebanon in 1982. And, uh, you know, we're seeing history literally repeat itself at this point, uh, rather than simply rhyming. Uh, Israel is uh, is attempting a ground incursion, or, is, or says it will, and says that it's, uh, it's a limited operation. That said, there's always another hill beyond the one that you're currently defending uh, from which your enemy is threatening you. And so there's always that impulse to take over, take over the next hill until you get to Beirut. And this, uh, you know, this will have the impact of unifying uh, Lebanese opposition to uh, to Israel's presence in the country, and uh, and it also eliminates the possibility that you know, with the backing of the international community, with the backing of uh, of Lebanon's allies, that there could be a way out of this in which the Lebanese state kind of reclaims some elements of its sovereignty over its foreign policy and over its defense and over its borders, but. What we're seeing is that that's not going to happen. Hezbollah is by no means eliminated. It still has a, a presence, even if its command structure and communications protocols are shaken by the last couple of weeks of, of Israel's relentless assault, even though Israel has destroyed uh, a lot of Hezbollah weaponry, as we can see from the secondary explosions happening after Israeli airstrikes. So the party is by no means gone, even if it's weakened, and, and uh, the next few months are going to be crucial in terms of determining how it absorbs the aftershocks of, of this absolutely monumental moment in Lebanon and Israel and, and Middle Eastern history. And where it goes from there is frankly an open question, one that, that isn't easy for anyone to answer, you know, outside of looking at a crystal ball and trying to predict the future. This has been The Lead from New Lines magazine. Karim Shaheen is on Twitter at K Shaheen. His and Hassan's essay, The Day After Hassan Nasrallah, is linked in the show notes or on Twitter at New Lines Mag. Yair Wallach is on Blue Sky at yairwallach.bsky. This week's episode was produced by Finbar Anderson and hosted by me, Faiz Al Yafai. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com. 